in a lot of ways, it is very much a game. Oh God! Mmm, <laughs> welcome to the Whiskey Tribe. Today, we're talking about how do distilleries, specifically whiskey distilleries, actually make money? This was a question that was inspired from a comment very long. <laughs> we did an episode called How to Open, How to Start a Ma Distillery Like a Magnificent Bastard. Mm -hmm. This is somewhat of an update, a little bit more of a different angle of approach. And specifically, we're talking about how other distilleries make money. We're really, really weird. We're an odd animal. We did everything backwards. Totally so backwards. So you cannot use us as an example. We're, yes. <laughs> we'll go through why later in the video here. Yeah. I would love to talk about this because at least once a month someone visits the tasting room who is a Magnificent Bastard yes. and they say, hey, I've been hanging out with you guys. I'm kind of interested in maybe doing something. So, it says, besides the difficulty of starting a distillery, how does one make money until your first barrels are mature? Yeah. Seriously, he's got a good water source, old family recipes, okay. and, and access to a business loan. Oh, wow, shit. Right? So first things first, the reason why this is just a dumb business model is pretty obvious. You're starting with the product that you have to wait years to sell. And it's the same thing as vineyards. <laughs> vineyards, like, it's uh, from the moment you plant grapes right. to the moment you can actually sell a bottle of wine, right. That's there's just nothing going on. Now, we have something better than vineyards, mm. which is you have a decision tree at first right. when you're starting a distillery. You can either source things mm -hmm. that you've selected, bring them to your distillery, right. do something to them, bottle them and release them while you're waiting on your own product. Sure. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Option two, mm -hmm. make things that don't require aging. So you're talking about vodka and gin, gin and infused spirits, things like this. No, right? that doesn't mean you can make beer because that's no. a different license, different, license. A different industry. Moonshine, right? Different kinds of moonshine. Right. That's all fine. And then you do that while you're putting away and aging. Now, someone who's done that really well in our area is right. still Austin. Yeah. Yeah, they had like six or seven different variations of things yeah. uh, while they've been waiting on their bourbon to finish, and that's pretty cool. They're just now getting to where they're starting to uh, come up on bottling their own bourbon. Yeah, they seem like nice people. I'm excited yeah. to see what they can come up with here. Here's what I will say, though. One of the weaknesses of creating non-whiskey stuff for two or three years while you wait on your own stuff is that you then have a marketing story you have to change midstream. If yeah. you are thought, if, if everyone for two and a half years only sees your brand and buys a moonshine and a gin, by the time you make your own whiskey, it's gonna take a good two to three years to recycle the brand image into we, these are whiskey people now. Whereas if you're sourcing, you're always whiskey people and the storyline is we now have our own stuff. Now, the, the, the so fork, that's your two choices. The fork in the road fairly early on, um, based on the amount of production capacity that you're likely to have, is are you aiming to get product on retail shelves or are you fortunate enough to have a good location where you think you can keep this thing rolling just with traffic in the tasting room? But if, if you're trying to make stuff enough stuff to get on retail shelves, you do need to be aware that competition for shelf space is fierce. Yeah. So having a good distributor that likes your product, that likes you, that has the relationships with the retail outlets that can, that can get you in the better locations, that's kind of a huge deal. And retailers these days, because there's so many craft distilleries, right. they're not jumping at every chance to work with a new distillery that they get. Yeah. Uh, so that, I mean, that's a rough path. And the thing is, you really need to be ready to have one, really good product that's easy to talk about and has a good story. And two, you need to have enough of it that if they manage to do all the work and get the chains to finally agree to carry you, <laughs> you're not gonna be like, here's my two boxes. <laughs> we have uh, retail stores and our distributors regularly contacting us, like for the love of God, we get people coming in asking about your whiskey. So yeah, give us something do you have loaded barrel? And no. right now it's still very early. Almost all of our whiskey is uh, earmarked for people in the Patreon. Yeah. Uh, and anything that's left over, we open it up to the Whiskey Tribe, and by that, by the time it goes through, and all then we that, try to keep the tasting room open. By the time it goes through all that, there's no whiskey left for retail. We shop. have so few whiskey that a couple of months ago we almost had to close the tasting room for a whole weekend <laughs> because we weren't didn't have any whiskey to sell <laughs> or to make drinks with. Yeah. We're, we're always gonna be making stuff, but yeah. with our community, with the tribe, how many different cool and amazing whiskeys can we source from different locations, can we experiment with, can we twist and turn and craft into really cool and interesting whiskeys based on what people are voting on, what they want to see 
um, in a bottle, what experiments they think are exciting. Right. This is why we took the path of whiskey adventurers, not uh, artisanal distillery. Yeah. Don't think of a whiskey distillery as anything other than what it is. It's a small business. Yeah. All of the um, struggles that a small business goes through. And the shelf space and the venues for purchase and getting attention for your product. And this comes to down, it comes down to how do you tell people about yourself? Because, you know, it, it's, you may have the best whiskey in the world. It's phenomenal. It's game changing. There's a lot of amazing whiskey. And you're living in a subjective environment, right? Yeah. This is not like we make this car, this car lasts longer, has better tires right. than this car. It's like, no, no, this is a spirit. So there's no such thing as I make the best whiskey and if they just tried it, they would understand. It's not how it works. That's not at all how it works. The mistake that we see time and time again, not just in whiskey distilleries that are starting out, but with small businesses in general is their approach to telling their story and getting the word out, which is critical to just get that momentum. You gotta do everything you can to get that momentum. It's always a very generic approach. Yeah, here's the it story told the by 90% of the craft distillers in the United States, uh, not just whiskey. We had this family history of uh, art and artisanal work and crafting things and in the whiskey and so we decided to make our own whiskey with a focus on small batch hand production uh, where we perfected our mash bill and we perfected the art of distilling and we're building on the shoulders of giants of our forefathers who had recipes they got before us right. and uh, we care about every step of the process we check the farms and we make we never let a barrel go past our quality control and we're historic and we're reviving the age-old tradition of fill-in-the-blank spirit and no one cares about the craft like we care about the craft because we're not just some nameless big brand we're artists and honestly <laughs> I've said this before we had no idea we were ever gonna have a distillery yeah started you guys from, made that happen. we started from a dinky little whiskey review channel and the goal every step of the way and there's been a lot of steps has been how do we give people what they want and what they're interested in in a way that you know is genuine to us yeah. but also gives them something fun and exciting and worthwhile uh, that is unignorable. I think that's the critical point. When we got to this point where we were trying to figure out what do we do for you guys and how do we create this thing, we had to find a way to, to get you guys what we thought you wanted while remaining authentic to, to ourselves. And we've said no to a lot of things. Uh, so many things. It, it, but the reality is there are stories that each of the stories I've met could tell that are really amazing. Yeah. And it's rarely the story they're actually telling. Yeah, because- Which I, I find incredibly frustrating. Well, and again, this is not industry specific. This is across the board, just businesses in general. Yeah, they every see, small business. They see how other competitors in the industry are doing things and assume that must be the right way to do it. And then you have everybody doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's impossible to become outstanding because you are literally one of the herd. When there is a shortcut when it comes to marketing your distillery. And it is a game that almost all craft distilleries play. Mm -hmm. And this is the festival game. This is the yeah. awards game, the competition game. I will say this, you don't have to say this, in a lot of ways it is very much a game. But that being said, whenever you walk away with a handful of prestigious awards, mm -hmm. then it you helps. Have, you have a lot of momentum, you have a lot of people talking about it, and it's easier to get stuff on shelves. Well, so there are people that walk down aisles of wine yeah. looking for the 97 out of 100 point sticker. Yeah. And they have people who walk down distillery shelves looking for the one gold in the San Francisco spirits. And they're like, oh, that must be cool. Look, if you're here to get rich, there's far better ways. If you're here to get famous, there's far easier ways. Mm -hmm. If you want to work inside an industry that you love and create cool shit that you think is amazing, right. then absolutely just plan to live off of a teacher's salary basically for the rest of your life. Not for all distilleries, but for many distilleries. If they were being honest, their true end game, what they would see is like, you know, the perfect future falling into their hands would be to someday make such amazing whiskey that was celebrated and loved that one of these giant corporations came knocking on the door, said, hey, can we buy your brand? You have amazing whiskey. We want to get into your business. 
I don't whenever, think that's a money grab. It's not a money grab because because when you start a small business doing anything, accounting or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you start a business because you love this thing, right? I really love cooking, mm -hmm. and I make really good empanadas. Right. I'm gonna do an empanada food truck. Yeah. Well, you end up only doing the thing you love like 10% of the time, and the rest of the time there's permits and accounting and bookkeeping and lawyers and forms and staff and hiring and firing and right. all the just insanity, right? So they're getting further and further away from the reason why they got into the business in the first place. Yeah, so of the people that I know who sold the bigger brands personally, yeah. I've not met a single one who left and were like, yeah, cash cow, I'm out. <laughs> I know all of them went, finally, I can stop doing this shit I never wanted to do in the first place and focus on the thing I actually wanted to do the whole time. Right. And they've gotten, if anything, more involved in the company. Um, selling the brand to a large corporation. Let's apply it directly to us. Mm -hmm. hey, we're doing stuff so weird and backwards. That would never work. The Crowded Barrel Whiskey Company and the Whiskey Tribe who's helping us craft these amazing whiskeys. It would never work. If Daniel and I ever stepped out of this situation, it's not like it's a brand that they could plug in some random rep and it keeps mm -hmm. doing what it's doing. We built a personality driven business. <laughs> and the moment the personalities are not in the personality driven business, right. It dies. I mean, imagine trying to watch Fixer, Fixer Upper season 18, but with a different couple. Right. It's the community, it's Daniel, it's me, and together we're going on this shared adventure. And our end game isn't to sell it to a large corporation. The thing that we want to see happen most is to have a whiskey distiller that is making a whiskey that's so amazing. We have good distribution. We have a lot of magnificent bastards that are just loving what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We have enough profit to build a damn whiskey castle in Austin, yeah. Texas. Yeah. That's what we want to do. I want to get to the point where we can make enough whiskey that every magnificent bastard that wants a bottle can get one. Like, I, I don't need to produce twice that amount. Right. I want just the amount where everybody who wants one gets one, right. and then that's, that's good. We're in the tasting room because the tasting room is a really big piece of the revenue. Yeah. And most distilleries, how often is their tasting room open? For us, it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right now. So I would say it's pretty common to be open on the weekends, for sure. And then what happens is, as the demand for your tasting room grows, hours expand. So there are places that have done things like add restaurants attached to their building and all kinds of things that the primary goal is to drive people to the distillery itself. The other thing we haven't really talked about is merch, distillery merch, because the hardcore whiskey lovers out there, whenever they find the distillery and they just fall in love with the whiskey, yeah. uh, then they want glasses, they want shirts. The thing is though, that's not gonna be a big chunk of change for the vast majority of distilleries no. out there. And most of it has to do with uh, with merch only around drinking, like glassware and coasters and things like that. How we doing, Felipe? Hey, How are you, man? Good. Final, final shot. We're in the barrel room because this is where the vast majority of the sweet, sweet money is being made. Now, the good news is. Um, as a distiller, you do spend quite a bit of time distilling. You have to spend yeah, a lot of time after distilling. After all the warnings, which is sort of the boot camp speech of like, if you don't belong here, then get out, you know. Uh, you do actually get to distill, and you get to blend, and you get to age things, and you get to do weird experiments, and it's all part of your job. That's pretty amazing. Are there resources available for people? Oh, there's a ton. So, okay. here's one of the coolest things. By and large, what I have found as we've gotten into the distillation community is that the people are open-handed, gracious, they want to teach, they want to show, they want to help, they want to contribute to other people opening things. So it's a great open community. You've got American Distillers Institute, ADI, you can sign up with them and they've got resources, all everything down to like here's how to fill out forms and here's maps for how to build a distillery, all kinds of cool shit. There's your state and local associations, uh, like in Texas we have the Texas Whiskey Association and uh, then the Texas Distilled Spirits Association, all of which exist to help promote new distilleries and help grow them and get them combined with uh, resources and community and the community is a really great one. On the whole, I think we've done a pretty good job of kicking off your illegitimate Daniel month. <laughs> oh, look. Oh my it's God. It's a dolphin. Hi, fellas. I guess Daniel month isn't going so smoothly after all. No, no, this, uh, he's just, I'm not really sure what's going on, the, actually. The snobby dolphin. Why, what brought the snobby dolphin back? It's the illegitimacy of the no, month. No, 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 the no. The illegitimacy no. of no, the no, month. No, no, the snob does not come from 
from illegitimacy. And there was no illegitimacy. <laughs> I am not engaging the premise. I only have one question and I've been dying to know. Okay. What is underneath the green cloak here? <laughs> I don't know if I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> This illegitimacy shall not stand. The powers of the Whiskey Mooch will rise again, and I shall forge a new path to Whiskey Glory.